for the marketing society. We are looking for someone who can help us with our social media efforts to run our Instagram, to um, just help us put our names out there so we can bring endorsements and help them one quote from all of the great things that we're doing this semester in the marketing department. So if you're interested or you know someone who in who's interested who would like to participate in the society, it's a really great opportunity to put leadership on your resume, get involved with the school. Um, just come reach out to me, Mikkel, or Adam, and we'd love to get you um, on the whole team. Um, so, yeah, so I'll, I'll introduce Nathan, and we, we there's a few job opportunities that are open right now, sorry, a little side note, and if you have any questions and are looking for a job currently, talk to Kayla, she's right up here, okay, so just to quickly introduce Nathan, um, Nathan is a digital marketer and a social media marketer, and just some professional background. So he's grown some of, uh, for example, Desert Digital Media social strategy and through their accounts from 100K followers to 110 million followers. He also created the world's most used adoption site, um, adoption.com, and he started his own digital marketing company. Some fun facts about Nathan. Um, him and his wife and three daughters uh, live here in Rexburg. Um, his oldest daughter is a BYU-Idaho student and is has been here for the last two semesters. And she's turning in her tuition papers. She has her call Tuesday? Wednesday, actually. Oh. So we get them Tuesday. Maybe Tuesday? That's going to matter. Um, he served his mission in Brazil, uh, Recife, Recife South. South. Um, and he's been back to Brazil about 25 times in business. Um, and he grew up in Tempe, Arizona, and his wife, like to present to you, Nathan. How many of you serve missions in Brazil? Which missions? Anyone else? I see a few other hands. Thank you. Uh, how many of you are from Arizona? Which parts of Arizona? Gilbert. Gilbert? Yeah, I used to live on Val Vista and Guadalupe. Oh, nice. Sahil over here. Lisa, mm -hmm. yes, okay. Yuma, my wife went to Yuma High School. I see Hannah Berry, yeah. Also Yuma. Yeah. So are you a criminal or a king or a. <laughs> Where did you go? Okay, so I want to start off with the conversation I had with, with the president of Deseret Digital Media. When I was working there for Clark Gilbert, Clark Gilbert, Clark was the CEO, and the president came to me one day and just said, why can't you do anything the normal way? And I actually took that as a badge of honor. Uh, it describes really well my personality. I don't see the world normally. Okay, I don't see the world in the same way, and I don't try to do the same things that other people are doing. I think if we, we want to do things that were never before accomplished, we have to employ methods that were never before attempted. We've got to be willing to look at it differently. Um, I want to start off by talking about normalcy bias. Has anyone ever heard that term? It's a term that's usually used in the emergency management profession. But I think it has a huge application in entrepreneurship and marketing. Yes? That's right. So, so basically, we think that anything that, uh, that we've experienced is what normal is. And anything outside of what we've experienced, we don't think is ever going to happen. Okay? So... By a show of hands, how many of you have ever lost a lot of money from a, st a stock market collapse? Okay, we have a couple. Uh, how many of you have ever, your family members have ever been in the middle of a massive hurricane that displaced lots of people? Okay, so you have a couple. Uh, how many of you, uh, think through some scenarios here. Uh, 
How many of you have been in a town when a terrorist attack has hit? Wow, that's a lot more responses than I thought there would be. Um, so these kinds of things I'm talking about, these major emergencies or crises, um, most of us never think about those happening, right? We don't live our day saying, I think that the terrorist attack is going to hit Rexburg, uh, or a military coup. Anyone lived through a military coup? Right? These are all things that, that we think are out there, and if someone was worried about a military coup or a stock market collapse or uh, you know, these things that I've been mentioning, you would, you, we might have a tendency to think they were weird, that they were abnormal, that they were crazy. Right? It's this concept of normalcy bias where we think that what we've seen and what we've lived through is normal. So I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. I'll give you a couple examples of, of things I've been through in my life. Uh, I was in the World Trade Centers the Friday before they were hit. I was in New York City on 9-11. I had a flight that was supposed to fly out that day. Uh, I was in Thailand when military coup took over the country. And the, the leader of the country was deposed and the, the military leader took over. And they're finally just having elections now. Uh, my sister was in Katrina, and you know, they got evacuated from Katrina, the highways were stopped, cell phone service didn't work, so she was texting me, and I was helping on the GPS, her GPS devices weren't working, to helping her find back roads to get out of Katrina and, and to be able to evacuate. Um, I, I was the CEO of a publicly traded company uh, when the dot-com bubble burst back in, two, in 1998. I lost $11 million on the stock market in one day. Um, I've, I've been through a lot of these situations. I'm trying to think which other ones. What other examples did I give? All those examples I gave were things I've lived through. Um, terrorist attacks, so I was there in 9-11 when, when it happened. Anyways, so because of the things that I've been through and that I've seen, how, what is my normalcy bias? How do I perceive the world differently from an emergency preparedness point of view? Those kinds of things are, are normal to you. On my mission, you know, I went 10 days without water one, you know, one week there, right? Water shortage is real to me. I've lived through those kinds of things. So how I perceive the world is, is normal to me is you need to prepare because those kinds of things happen, right? Um, okay, so this isn't an emergency preparedness talk. This is a normalcy bias talk. So how do you think normalcy bias applies to marketing? right. So what happens if pay-per-click marketing is doing really well, and so 50,000 college students take pay-per-click marketing classes and, and get their certifications, and everybody goes and does the same pay-per-click marketing? What's the reality of that? All right, so let's talk concepts here. So the first concept we talk, we've been discussing is the normalcy. The second concept is the concept of the commodity. Who can define for me what the term commodity means? What is a commodity? Yeah. That's right. So what's an example of a commodity around here that, that Rexburg produces a lot of that's a commodity? Yeah, potatoes. Potatoes is a commodity. Why are potatoes a commodity? Because it's the same potato from this farmer than the other farmer. You may try to differentiate yourself. Thank you very much. You may try to differentiate yourself um, by growing a smaller potato or a red potato, or you may try to find some unique advantage. You may take your potatoes and cut them up and sell them as French fries, right? You're trying to differentiate your product. You want to get out of commodity spaces, right? And you want to. Um, Kai Kawasaki has a chart that he likes to use to see this. This axis is value, and this axis is unique. And so, Guy 
Guy Kawasaki talks about you want to get as far right and as high as you can on this chart. You want to be right here. So give me some examples. What would be something that's right here? What's something that's really unique but has no value? Yeah. Yeah, although they didn't sell a whole bunch of those. So give me an example of something that that's really unique but it nobody would buy it. Okay. <laughs> you need paint. Maybe you paint really good, but assuming you don't, okay. <laughs> All right, so maybe a bad painting. What's something right here? It has lots of value but isn't unique. Michael Dell sold these. What did Michael Dell sell? Anyone know Michael Dell? Yeah. Yep. So, so computers, Dell computers. This was Dell's problem. They were really, they, there was value there, but they weren't unique. You know, lots of other people had competing ones that did the same thing, right? So it became very, very hard for him to compete. Can you give me some examples of products that might be right here that they maximize uniqueness and value at the same time? Yeah. Yeah, I think that fits pretty well. The iPhone is a really good example. The iPod is a really good example too. Like the iPhone is getting less and less unique as, as time goes on. The competitors get better. But like when think of when the iPod came out, right? Nobody else had anything like that. You could store your your uh, music digitally, and, and there really wasn't another solution that did that. And they were able to charge a premium amount and provide a lot of value as well. Okay, so we want to get away from the the commodity. The way you get away from the commodity is getting as far to the right and as high as you can. Um, okay, going back to normalcy bias. Um, so I, I, I was a little bit critical of pay-per-click marketing. Pay-per-click marketing is amazing. It is that and Facebook marketing are the two best ways to do digital marketing right now. It's paid ways to see results and, and they work. They work really well. I'm, I'm not criticizing. But what's the problem if you get 50,000 new certified pay-per-click campaigners that are all out competing for the business? Yeah, it's a commodity. And what happens when you're trying to sell a commodity? It, 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 commodity is pricing is driven down to what? What is the profit driven down to? Break even. Zero. It gets driven down to break even. It gets driven down to no profit. Okay, so what do you have to do if you're in a commodity industry, what do you have to do if you're a potato salesman? Yeah. Potato farmer. That's right. You have to come up with a new way to do PPC. You have to bundle it with something else. You have to pick a specific niche. We do PPC for dentists and become the expert in that niche, right? You've got to find a, a unique landing page, you know, funnel that you take them to. But you've got to find a way to differentiate yourself where you're not a commodity. There's no profitability, or very little profitability in commodity. There, that's not always a true statement. There's some years the potato farmers do really well, and it's and it comes down to when the supply and demand don't match, and they, there's not enough supply, and and so they can you know charge really good rates. But on average, you know supply and demand being equal, it goes to zero in profit. Okay. Why would I bring up normalcy bias, though? I want to talk about it just a little bit more. Um, there is a there is a desire to say, what did everybody else do? You know, they did pay per click this way, they did SEO this way, they did SMM this way, and I'm going to do it the exact same way. And I think one of you said it that you start seeing diminishing returns on that and you start seeing a commodity, <coughs> normalcy bias works the other way, where you think this is normal, but as a marketer, your job is to not think normal. Your job is to not do things that everybody else has done. Your job is to figure out what has to be accomplished, and then figure out the best way to get there. And that may include pay-per-click marketing, that may include SEO, but it may include three other ideas that have never been used before. 
So be really careful about saying, I'm a digital marketer, therefore I do pay-per-click and SEO. Those are two weapons in your quiver. Those are two tools that you have available, but you've got to learn everything, right? You've got to learn all of the different tools that you need so you can go into a situation and figure out the best way to help your client achieve the end goal. If you're just selling pay-per-click management, you're selling commodity. If you sell the ability to help your client achieve the most important goal they have, that's priceless. That's the difference. Okay. Uh, how many of you heard me speak last week pretty good over the next class? I don't know if I'm getting you guys yet, but I'm going to talk just a little high level of something I said in that class, and I'm sorry for saying it again. And then we're going to go a little bit deeper on that. Um, What, what are the two major ways that mountains get formed? Volcanoes is one, and what's the other one? Tectonic plates that do what? <coughs> yeah, so you have these, these plates that uh, the Earth's crust that are pushing together and making these mountains. So massive movement can happen from these tectonic plates uh, going against each other. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> what tectonic changes uh, have, have you guys seen? What is What tectonic changes in marketing have happened in the last 20 years? Who can name a couple? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a great one. Okay, what else? Social media. Yes. Digital funnel. I'm sorry, say that a little louder. Digital funnel. Signage? Explain what you mean by that. Oh, like the billboard now? Oh, or yeah. Digital. digital signs? Okay. Let's put that down. Okay. Very popular with that. So I'm going to write that as attention span. That is a huge. This is a really big deal right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't call that a tectonic, but you're right. Maybe. I think it's a small little footprint. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What else? Give me a couple more. That's right. So educated buyers, okay. Uh, a couple of other really big ones. Uh, how about mobile devices, right? Huge change in marketing. Um, so let me give you a couple of statistics that illustrate a couple of, of these tectonic shifts that I want to talk about today. The, these are ones that are happening right now. And the reason I, I want to talk about tectonic shifts is when I was in your spot, when I was a a junior at BYU in Provo um, 22 years ago. Uh, the internet, that first one, was just happening. The internet had kind of come out when I was on my mission. I had come back and I was writing a business plan, a thesis on how to use the internet. And, and there was this great opportunity that happened where those tectonic plates were shifting. I guess that's the point I want to make. I'm trying to show you guys where to find opportunities that you can go create your own business, that you can go stake your own claim that nobody else, you can get out of this commodity world and go find your own world game changer, right? And, and what I'm trying to say is those opportunities happen where those tectonic plates are shifting, okay? So if you want to find your place to change the world, find where the tectonic plates are shifting, okay? So here's a couple statistics. Uh, 55% of corporate website visitors leave the site within 15 seconds. When I started my first business, there weren't that many cable stations, there weren't that many internet sites, and we could expect people to come through the website, read what, through what was there, and pick what they wanted. Do people do that anymore? Like, it's a big deal if you can get them to scroll past the first page. We... We don't have the luxury of having long websites anymore. There's this huge attention span problem. For every minute you have available to spend on the internet, 
there's so many different things you can do. And if you haven't grabbed their attention within 15 seconds, most of the people are gone. Okay? So how do you solve that problem? That's, that is a huge tectonic shift happening right now. And most businesses have not addressed this. How do you solve that? Yeah. Give them what they want. Give them what they want really fast. Like a good way of doing it is through video. A super easy way is to just like sit back and relax and let them do it. Yep. Like you know, like you can we see a lot of a lot of leaders and corporations that do video and like You're exactly right. Video is, is one of the best ways to do a bigger strategy. It was the first step. In, in a bigger strategy, and it's called the sales funnel. How many of you are familiar with the technology click funnels? Yeah, developed by a member of the church, lives in Boise, right here in our state, made more than $100 million last year off of this. And there's a lot of people talking about the death of the website, and I'm one of those people that I agree with them. I agree with the people that are talking about that. Um, if you can switch from a website to a funnel, it doesn't apply to every business, but I think the vast majority of the businesses, you can radically improve your conversions. And so the concept is, is, like think of the Amazon checkout process, right? You buy your product, you say you want to buy, all of a sudden they remove most of the header, they remove all of the left and the right side, they remove the footer, they remove all of the distractions, and they say, now just do this, confirm your address. Okay, now you've confirmed your address, now confirm your payment, right? They take you step by step through the process with no distractions. Um, so as, as I've been designing sales funnels for clients, almost always, as we've done A-B testing, in fact, always, I've never seen a landing page of a funnel that had a video that, that didn't do better than one without a video. So videos always perform well. You capture their attention, you establish credibility, you hook them, right? So that's usually the first thing you want to do. And then you move to the next step, which is usually a lead magnet usually giving something away for free so you can capture their information. Uh, the reason that the lead magnet is so important is generally, on average, about 4% of visitors to our website are ready to make a purchase. In other words, you're losing 96% of your people. Most businesses are just happy that of the 100 people they drove in, four people contacted them or bought something or took some kind of action but they forget that they just lost 96% of the traffic they paid to get to their website. So how many of you are familiar with lead magnets? Um, who can give me a good example of a lead magnet? Yeah. With like a form fill generation um, fee way, so like put in your information for a free like appraisal for your home. So the form isn't, but the, the, the free appraisal is. It's something that you can give them for free that generally you don't have a lot of cost in it and you give it for free in exchange for their contact information and the right to market to that person. There's a great study that was done recently on which types of lead magnets are the best at getting client uh, contact information good. Um, how much longer do we have? What time is this over? Okay. Um, so, so uh, it, the study came back and showed 81% of people are willing to give up their contact information in exchange for a white paper. That was the best performing lead magnet. And then 73 or 74% of the people were willing to give up their contact information for an ebook. You guys have seen all sorts of websites where they say, get a free ebook and learn how to do this. The reason they do that is to get your contact information so they can market to you. Yes? That's right. You write your ebook, you have your upfront cost, but then it's nothing to send it out each time. Right? Very little marginal cost thereafter for them to send it out. Okay, so so that's usually the second step in the funnel. And I, I don't have a lot of time to go into all of the steps in the funnel, but I challenge you to look into sales funnels. I challenge you to add that as another tool in your tool belt, another weapon in your arsenal that you've got. And pay-per-click is important, and SEO are really important, and and those are critical. Those send people into the top of your funnel. The problem is if all you do is pay-per-click and all you do is SEO, you're going to do really good sending your clients clients and leads, but then they're not going to convert them. And then they're going to come and tell you you did a bad job. So you've got to be able to help your client take those leads and maximize the amount of, of revenue that they're able to generate from those leads. 
And so, so uh, I guess that's the concept here, which is sales funnels. I, I believe that sales funnels are an essential thing for every digital marketer to know, to know how to do well. And click funnels is the best technology to do that right now. Okay, the second uh, tectonic shift that I want to talk about that's happening right now. Um, I'll give a statistic that shows the problem, and you, you tell me tell me the why. Uh, there's a stat I saw about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, that said 84% of millennials don't trust essentially anything that a corporation says about itself. So I'll give you some examples. If you, if you wanted to buy a new SUV, would you ever go to Toyota and ask Toyota what the best SUV was? Ever? Would anybody in this room do that? When, when I was younger, 20 years ago, that's how you did it. You went and you talked to the sales reps at the different dealerships, and you, you found out about the product from the company. But I would venture to say nobody would do it that way anymore. If you wanted to find, well, first of all, why would you not trust what Toyota says about itself? That's right. That's right. Uh, I'll give you an example of the church having this problem. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was two or three years in a row where the church had declines in convert baptisms. And, well, let me step back and tell you a little bit more of the story. Um, you guys were probably not even alive when, some of this, when this happened, but the church was pretty slow about launching a website. Those of us in digital marketing were kind of frustrated and really wanted the church to have a website. And the way the church works is, is they take longer to do it, but then they do it right. Right? It's the church's MO. So that, that's how it should be. Um, and so in this period of time when the church didn't have a website, a lot of units and people created their own websites. A lot of university wards or family home evening groups or gospel doctrine teachers started creating a lot of these websites. And, and there's a lot of good stuff out there. And then... When LDS.org finally launched, they had a church unit website section on the web on just through LDS.org, and in the letter that was sent out from the first presidency, they asked everybody um, who who had an existing unit website to take it down and use the unit website on LDS.org. So uh, there was a law of unintended consequences that happened as a result of that letter. What do you think happened? So that may have happened. There was maybe a little bit of that, but that wasn't the big problem. There's a much bigger problem. Yeah. Yes. So all of those good websites that were popping up at the top got taken down. Okay. And does does that mean that Google shows less results? What happens? Google still shows the same results, but now you've got a huge vacuum. You don't have any good websites anymore. What's showing up? All the anti-websites filled the void. So going back to this credibility marketing concept, the missionaries were going in. The missionaries were teaching people the discussions. Were the missionaries credible? No. For the same reason Toyota wasn't credible talking about itself. The missionaries weren't credible. The missionaries, they expected the missionaries to only tell them the church was true. And so what, what do you think most people did in this digital generation after they left after the missionaries left and finished the discussions where did the investigator go they went to the internet and they did a search to try to confirm the validity of what the missionary just told them and instead of finding all that good stuff that used to be there they were getting all the anti information and the baptisms were declining and if you remember at the time the internet was so new you guys don't remember this but the internet was so new there was a lot of uh, uh, there was a lot of church leaders that were talking about the bad things of the internet, which were true. Um, you know, there was pornography there. There was, you know, gambling. There were a lot of bad things on the internet. And so people were warning people about the bad things of the internet. And so the people that wanted to do good things were concerned. They didn't know if that was okay to do. Um, so, so what do you think the church leaders did? 
I'll give you a hint. It was Elder Ballard that did it, that <laughs> took the charge. Do you remember what Elder Ballard did? Yeah. So what happened before that talk, that was a BYU and Hawaii talk, and then it was a, an Ensign article. Um, he called me into his office, and he said, Nathan, what should we do? And that's a scary place to be. Um, and and uh, I'm sure I didn't give him the right answers, but but I tried to convey this this concept. And do you remember what Mormon.org became? Do you remember not what it is now, but do you remember what it was five years ago? The Mormon videos everywhere. Yeah. So the I'm a Mormon videos. Why do you think the church would have put the I'm a Mormon videos? So, so if, if the missionary is incredible, who's the most credible, what's the credible voice the church could put out there? If I'm a skateboarder in California, and I can have a skate, another skateboarder in California sharing his testimony, he's credible, right? I'm part of his tribe. If, uh, if I'm a, a, whatever, a single dad, you know, that's struggling with these issues, which I'm not, but... Um, uh, and there's another single dad sharing his testimony about how the church strengthened his relationship with his kids or something, all of a sudden that's a credible voice. So this, the church had to make the shift to something that I call credibility marketing. Okay? So I gave that statistic earlier that 84% of people, 84% uh, of millennials, excuse me, and this is still happening across all demographics, it's just a lot more in the millennial kind of group. 84% of millennials aren't trusting <coughs> what corporations say about themselves. So in other words, Toyota can't come out and say, we have the best SUV. Um, Carrie Ann's can't come out and say, we have the best custard in town. If you're traveling to a new city and you want to find, you're in the mood for Mexican food, you want to find the best tacos in town, and a restaurant says, you know, best tacos in town on their window, do you even believe that? Is that even worth anything? It's not. It's totally worthless, that message on their window. Where do you go to find out best tacos in town? Yelp. Yelp. Like what? Yeah, okay. So, so you've got to get someone that's credible telling people why you're amazing. You can't tell people why you're amazing. So that credibility marketing concept is the second major tectonic shift that I think is happening in our world. Um, huge opportunity in, in these two areas right now for digital marketers to find something new. I would say 90% of businesses aren't doing either of these two things. Uh, one of the tectonic shifts that happened 18 years ago, uh, see if you guys can guess. How many of you are, I guess most of you are old. All of you are old. Uh, what is a tectonic shift that happened when almost every business drove, most businesses drove a huge amount of their business from yellow pages? Okay, there was a tectonic shift that happened related to yellow pages. What was that tectonic shift? Yeah. Google listings? Yep, well, well, before Google listings was something or else. Or Before that. Oh, come on, you guys can get this one. What was the tectonic shift? People, if, if the majority of businesses that did not make this shift, they either went out of business or they lost a huge drop in revenue. Massive tectonic shift. From going from yellow pages, not white pages, keep going, keep thinking. Which part of the internet? Where did they take their dollars that they were spending in Yellow Page? I put them in. Oh my goodness. Nope. Yelp didn't exist. This is the first company to revolutionize pay-per-click advertising. Which company was it? Google. I heard someone say it. Raise your hand. So, okay. Google. So, 18 years ago, Google rolled out something called Google AdWords. Google AdWords almost overnight revolutionized the industry. And you had companies that were market leaders for years 
you know, for decades in their space based on yellow pages that didn't make that shift, thousands and thousands and thousands of those businesses went out of business. Or if they did go out of business, they saw massive drops in their revenue. But new companies that maybe before didn't have good yellow page spots because they didn't have the budgets for it, they were able to dive in. They were able to be first adopters of, of Google pay-per-click advertising, and they built empires overnight. They were at that edge of the tectonic shift um, of, of yellow page, the yellow page to, to Google ad transition. Again, another example of uh, be, it, be where those tectonic plates are shifting and you're going to find opportunity. So I'd like to ask you guys about credibility marketing. How many of you consider yourself millennials? Um, what counts as credibility marketing for you? If I run an ad and you're not going to, if I run an ad saying why my business is awesome and you're not going to believe that, how can I reach out to you? Influencers, that's a really good idea. Why? And what kind of influencers? So they're like you and they maybe know a little bit more about the, the market that you're going into. So let's say I was doing influencer marketing for a garage organization company, right? Would uh, Beyonce be a good influencer for that? <laughs> Even though she's got a whole bunch of reach, why not? She's not relevant to that niche. So you've got micro-influencers and you've got macro-influencers, right? So, so forget about the macro-influencers. Um, there's a few situations where they're relevant, but um, their conversion rates, I've seen stats where the conversion rates are like one-eighth. They have a lot of reach, but they're not relevant. Focus on the, on the micro-influencers that relate to the, the ideal customer and have subject matter expertise. They're going to convert at a, at a much higher rate and be a lot less expensive. Yeah. That's right. Be, what, what's the difference between those two? One is the company talking about themselves. And the other is the influencer telling people that the product is great. Massive difference. Okay, so influencer marketing is one. Yeah. Influencers want to affiliate with you. Okay, so I wouldn't, but maybe you're defining it in a different way. Influencers do affiliate marketing, right? And so what a, what a lot of businesses do is they will go to an influencer that's relevant to their niche, that has credibility in their niche, and they will say, I will give you 30% of whatever you can sell. Here's the affiliate link. And so it, it's both. It's affiliate marketing and it's influencer marketing. Now, it's not working because it's an affiliate program. It's working because it's the influencer program, but the affiliate program is how the influencer gets paid. But you're right. Those influencer marketing and affiliate programs work hand in hand in many situations. Many of the bigger influencers won't do it that way. They require flat payments, but because they know their stuff. <laughs> All right. What else? Yeah. Yes, reviews are huge. All right, so what do you think if something has 200 reviews and they're all positive? Is it credible? No. No, you actually lose credibility by being perfect. Let's say something only has four reviews. Is it credible? No, what do you assume? It's their mom and their yeah, family members that have gone and reviewed the product, right? So what do you have to do to make your reviews credible? Yeah. You gotta have what? Some detractors. You need a few other voices to make it real. It so yeah. Yeah, so people that are going into depth, yeah, they're not just giving you the stars, but they're so so I call that storytelling. And that's another that's been going on for a while, so I don't know if that's a newer tectonic shift, but that is a, I would almost go so far as saying, I think 80% of great digital marketing right now is storytelling. And I call it story selling. I have 60 authors that work for me, but I don't call them authors, I don't call them writers, I call all of them storytellers. 
Their job is to tell stories. And in great marketing copy, um, all great marketing copy today, I believe, has four things. It has to have a hook. You have to do something that establishes credibility so people will listen to it. You have to tell a great story, and you have to have an offer. Every email you're sending out, every landing page, it has to have those four elements. If you're not doing those four elements, you're probably going to fail. Uh, the only thing I, I, I think it's probably the same is that even though some of these are like maybe the focus of the market, you do have some stories that you might sell the product to people. Yeah. And they can see, okay, they can tell the same kind of story. Uh, so or that I can look. So is it easy a game to text your group? Yeah, kind it kind of is. You could get your friends, you could get your family. There's things you could do to get to text your group. Would a video review be gameable? It'd be a lot harder to game a video review. Why is it seems like video reviews would be the holy grail here in credibility marketing? Um, obviously, we could film our testimon testimonials of our customers, but anyone know why Google does not have any video reviews. Yeah. Just to guess, pick up on the premise about storage. Yeah, they would do it. They would not care. The value of that would far outweigh any storage cost. But good, good thought. Yeah, so what's the answer to that? Is it the same? Um, the one that you said about it? I, I, so I know the exact answer, so I can say no, if that's not <laughs> why they haven't done it yet. But yes. So the company could do a few videos that way. But let's say you had hundreds of videos. Like it gets really hard for a company to, to game it that many times. It seems like it's a lot harder to game. Yeah. How hard can you make an offer to someone you already have an existing relationship? Yeah, that's that is a very true statement. But why why does Google not have videos? So there are two LDS brothers that live in Gilbert. Who lives in Gilbert? Who live in Gilbert? They or they live in What's the town just e just by Queen Creek? Oh, going, uh, going east, um, further east than, than Queen Creek. Yeah, I didn't know it when I lived here. But anyways, yeah. they live in their offices in Gilbert, and they have a patent pending on video reviews. It's a, a little company called So Tell Us, and they are going to sell for a billion dollars soon. I guarantee you, they're going to make a billion dollars. Um, it, the industry has to go this direction. As long as their patent gets issued, which look, keep our fingers crossed that's going to happen, um, Google will, Google's already sent a vice president down to talk to them. Um, so, so review, influencers and reviews. Uh, video reviews, I, I can tell you, is, is going to be, be the holy grail. What else? What else would, would appeal to you? How else do I sell to you as a millennial? How do I establish credibility? No, you go first. Oh, okay. Sorry. I think you can set up almost like third party third party platforms that allow custom you know, potential customers to ask previous customers to interact. Okay. And so I don't know if this is super applicable to credibility marketing, but you can look at things like Uber, you look at things like Couchsurfing, where they're creating huge amounts of trust by just providing a platform where they're not really doing a lot, but they're allowing someone to kind of credi like establish credibility themselves yeah. and then interact with. That's right. Customers. The concept of couch surfing would never work if I just went out and found a random person and said, can I stay with you? Because I don't have credibility and they don't have credibility for me. I don't know that they're not an ax murderer, rapist that's gonna you know, hurt me and my family in the middle of the night, right? But because they have reviews, Right? You can see a track record of, of success. It's credible. That's right. So, it, so you call that maybe a credibility pla platform. Creating a credibility platform right now, like that would be a great business opportunity. 
you can think of what industry doesn't have a credibility platform right now and you can create that and you can run that, that would be huge. Okay? Yes? So you're making a decision yourself. What did you say, Hobo Butler? Hobo or Hobo Butler. Okay. Because when you're doing some running, you can use the Pocket Team to run that and you can run it. And you realize that you can make that mistake so often. You make this huge mistake. You're going to actually shed that and you start winning the most popular post up in every single week. <laughs> you have post two post out for the entire Pocket Team. It wasn't a real run. That's a really huge mistake. Yeah. That's so right. You know, Yeah, so, so today, 70 to 80% of your customers as a business are going to find your reviews before they buy your product. They're going to go look for it on third-party credible reviews. So if you're doing a funnel or you're doing a website for a business, you've got to figure out how to help them win reviews. You've got to figure out how to help them get those reviews on their own website. You've got to figure out how to help them get video reviews. Especially when that's public with in a room, when people post problems on a Facebook page and then you quickly resolve it on your Facebook page, people can see that you've provided good customer service. I agree. That gives them credibility. Yeah, last one. Um, another one I think is I don't know that we really talked about a lot, but just all the algorithms that play with this stuff. I mean, Google Maps is a huge credibility thing. Um, I mean, pretty much. So it, it already is. Google My Business is driving, for businesses that do it well, it's driving most of their business now. It is, it is the best digital marketing tool for a company to use. I would agree. Okay, uh, let's open it up for questions. We've talked about normalcy bias. We've talked about don't be a commodity. We've talked about tectonic shifts. We've talked about a couple of tectonic shifts that are happening now. Look for those as you do your consulting. Make sure you, you can go out and help people. Uh, take advantage of those tectonic shifts and position yourself as an expert there. And, and a cool thing is, there's not many experts in these kinds of things. So this guy that's been doing digital marketing for 20 years, he's not an expert here. You can differentiate yourself. I think someone at lunch was asking me that question. How do you differentiate yourself um, You know, when you don't have all the experience? You go find your spot in the shift in the tectonic plates where none of your competitors are so you mentioned Russell Brunson, and I'm yeah. a big fan of his. Do you actually use ClickFunnels for yes. your personal you do? Every single one of my clients that come to ClickFunnels is massive. Would you recommend us to like purchase it to test it out? Or? Uh, yeah, I recommend the university contact them and try to get like a free, free licenses for their students or something. You probably do that. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Sure. So you talked about kind of like us going out and finding opportunities to do this. Um, now we may feel like we have the knowledge and the ability to do it, but we may not have the experience on a resume. And so how do you uh, propose that we gain clients as consultants or something like that um, to bring in that sure. without the experience, but with the knowledge or maybe we got the degree and it, we don't have the experience. So the, the guy you mentioned just now, Russell Brunson from Boise, member of the church, um, made $100 million last year teaching people how to do it. What do you think his expertise is? What do you think? 
Yeah, but like what kind of certification or degree do you think he has? Do you think he has a marketing degree? He doesn't. He got a C in marketing. Uh, he, he barely got his college degree. Right? A lot of times we think we need those certifications. Now, the difference, so I, I said this at lunch, I'll say this again, you have to get to the edge of knowledge. There's no way to, not, to do it without going to the edge of knowledge. The concept of the edge of knowledge is you need to pick your niche. Like let's say you wanted to be the, the sales funnel expert for dentists in the world or something like that, right? You need to learn everything you possibly can learn about that. You need to go to Russell Brunson's conference. You need to read all of his books. You need to buy all of his trainings. You need to you know, learn everything there is to know about sales funnels, right? And put in a thousand hours becoming the sales funnel expert. And all of a sudden, you're standing at that edge of knowledge. Pretty soon you're looking forward and you're seeing there's really not anybody in this dental space that knows sales funnels like I do. I'm the world's leading expert in sales funnels for dentists. And you didn't have to have a ton of clients, you just had to go learn all of the knowledge to get there. And obviously, doing the client work is gonna help you. You know, you may have to go do the, Russell talks about how he got his first client, he just did it for free. You may just have to go find a few dentists and just say, can I please build your funnel for free just so I can have someone come on your resume. But after you do two or three of them and they give you testimonials and you're an expert and you've learned everything, you, you can compete with just as well you know, as those people who've been doing it 10 years. It's not as hard as you think. Okay, what other questions? If not, I'll teach another concept and then I'll get on the show. Okay, so one of my consulting clients that I had uh, was was called Family Link. His name was Paul Allen. He was the guy that started Ancestry.com. And he hired me as his chief revenue officer for Family Link. We created a, a we're related, an app, a Facebook app called We're Related, and we grew it to be I think 60 million app installs. We were the fourth largest Facebook app. And when I started with him, he didn't have any revenue. He hired me as a 15 hour a week consultant to be his chief revenue officer. And I added five million dollars of revenue in that first 12 months for him. Uh, and then we did so well, we became the fourth largest Facebook app that Facebook said, thank you for proving what our clients want. We're gonna take what you do in your app, build it into our core Facebook functionality, and we are going to remove all of the apps that people have installed on their Facebook page. So you can't compete with us anymore. Facebook overnight put us out of business. Okay, so this goes back to the normalcy bias point. We, we built a business, it was a $5 million a year business, 60 million app installs in one year, and then Facebook put us out of business. The normalcy bias for Facebook would be what? People would assume that what Facebook is doing today, they're gonna do forever. Or that what Instagram is doing today, they're gonna do forever. If you look at the history of what these digital platforms do, they consistently always do one thing. What is, who knows what, like Amazon, for example. Amazon used to be an awesome business opportunity where you'd go to China, you'd source a product, you'd put it on Amazon, and you'd make a ton of money. What did Amazon do with that information? After everybody did that, made a ton of money. Has anyone seen Amazon Basics? That's what Amazon Basics is. They find the best-selling products, they have all the data, they know what's best-selling, they cut you out of the loop, they go straight to China, they source the same product, and they sell it themselves, and they preference themselves in the listing, okay? What do digital platforms do? Just like commodities trend towards zero profitability, what do digital platforms always do? Yeah, go, go up here. Adapt and evolve to meet the needs of the market. No, I would not give Facebook that. <laughs> because if they had done that, hey Reg, or Brother Alan, <laughs> um, if they had done that, like I have, let's say I had a Facebook page that had 300,000 people that had signed up to find out about my posts about adoption. If I post on that, does my post go out to 300,000 people? Even the people that subscribed to follow that asked to get my information? No, what do I have to do to get my post to go out? I have to pay Facebook to get my message to be sent to someone that already subscribed to get my message, that already paid to get subscribed to get my message. If, if Facebook really cared about 
you know, if, if their goal was creating the best user experience, they would allow people to get the messages that they were subscribing to. Okay, so if, if user experience isn't what, what they're going out for, what is it? What do all social platforms, digital platforms, go towards? Monopolization, maybe. Yeah, what else? They change to make money. Why do they change to make money? Because they go public, they have investors, and the market forces force them to grow profitability every quarter, right? They have to. And so you take someone like Amazon that says, we're just gonna be a platform, and they say, okay, where can we make money? Oh, okay, we can go source the products ourselves. You take Facebook that says, we have all these people wanting to send messages to their followers, we're gonna charge them to send followers. It just, it has to happen, right? So is the normalcy bias that a social network will, or digital platform will stay the way it is? Is that reasonable? No, what should we expect when we build platforms? When we work on a platform, we do a Facebook page, we sell on Amazon, what should we expect? It will change towards their profitability and not ours. Okay, so knowing that, what do we do? Do we not do Facebook? Do we not do Amazon? Do we not do Instagram? Hopefully it doesn't get messed up, like Facebook did, yeah. Do what you need to find them. You stay in front of them. But what is it that I need to, all right, so I, I, have, I have a core mantra and I call it own, own the land on which you build your skyscraper. What happens if you spend tens of millions of dollars building a skyscraper and you build it on land you don't own? Maybe you have a short-term lease on that land. Yeah. Yeah? Go ahead, back there. Yeah, and you lose all the value you've built, like we did at Family Link, right? So how, in digital marketing, how do you own the land that you build your skyscraper on? I keep calling on you and I feel really bad. I'm gonna, I need some new hands here. I keep calling the same people. How do you own the land that you, you build your skyscraper on in digital marketing? Yeah. So do your research, know your niche audience, but then what if your niche audience is still on Facebook? How do you own your land? Very back. Yes. So, so you're, you're mostly right. You're 80% of the way there. You drive them to things that you own, but specifically, getting them to your website is okay, but remember what I said, only 4% of people take action 96% of people that come to your website don't take action. So you're gonna lose them forever. They, if they come to your website and don't take action, you lose 96% of the people. What do you need to do? Give me a new name and a new person. You need a lead magnet and you need to capture their contact information. You need their email address, phone number if you can get it. You need to be able to message them, permission to market to them, right? The goal is to capture the contact information and the right to market to the customer. That is the land you want to own. So it's okay to use Facebook, but the goal of Facebook is to drive people to your website where you capture you know, their contact information and the right to market to them. It's okay to use Amazon to sell a product. The goal is to drive people back to the land that you own. And with that, I hope that will help. Thank you very much.